uh, is the equivalent in baseball of an unassisted triple play. Okay, that is something you know is like theoretically possible, but you never actually expect to see it. Because what Pope Francis did is the following. First, one of the standard criticisms of the way the Vatican deals with money uh, is that they have clerics in charge of it who have no training in finance or business management. So Francis created this new council, because it used to be the overseers of Vatican finances was a council of 15 cardinals. Francis abolished that. He created a new body that has eight cardinals, but seven world-class business professionals on it. Okay, so he's brought lay expertise into the mix. But at the same time in the Vatican, nobody takes you seriously if you don't put a heavy hitter cleric in charge of something, and that's what he did with Pell, right? So he both brought in lay, you know, the, the lay voice, but at the same time also sent a signal that he's serious. That's one. Two, um, another standard criticism of the Vatican in terms of money uh, is that the whole show I is run way too much by Italians. And, and listen, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm basically Italian by adoption. I love Italy. I, I have a hard time functioning any place else. So this is not an anti-Italy rap, but it's a plain fact that there are a lot of practices that the rest of the world would perceive as corrupt that Italians just don't see that way. Okay, like if you've got a competitive bidding procedure, but instead you steer the contract to your cousin, <laughs> which happens all the time, they don't think of that as corrupt. They think that's what a mensch does, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, you've got a budget, but, uh, or, you know, take another example. You're a teller at the Vatican Bank, and a Monsignor walks in and says, I've got 10 grand in cash I'd like to deposit. It would never occur to you to ask, where'd you get that money? That's just, again, not what you do, right? Uh, and so by appointing an Anglo-Saxon to run the show, he kind of sent a signal he wants to break through that. And third, and this again is the savvy Jesuit politician. You know, Pell is, in, in many senses, politically and theologically, fairly far to the right, whereas Bergoglio is much more of a moderate, right? So, in many ways, they're not exactly on the same page. Okay. I mean, there was a rumor two or three years ago that George Pell might take over at the Congregation for Bishops. Had that happened, it wouldn't surprise me if Pope Francis right now were figuring out how he could gently get rid of him, okay? However, this is the one area in which Bergoglio and Pell are one hundred percent in lockstep. Okay, which illustrates the, a broader point, which is Francis has a genius for putting the right guys in the right job. He appointed the best Vatican diplomat of his generation as Secretary of State. He appointed a true reformer from the government of the Vatican City State to be uh, the new head of the Vatican's financial watchdog unit, this thing called IFE. Uh, and he appointed the single cardinal most identified with financial glasnost and with the greatest personal capacity to get it done to run this new secretariat, right? Unassisted triple play. Okay. Uh, listen, uh, that was the last one, right? So let me, let me say one last thing be before they pull the plug from the microphone, uh, which is uh, I want this to be the beginning of a conversation among us, not the end, okay? So let me just make you this offer. Uh, if there is ever any way I can be of help to anyone in this room tonight, and honestly, I have no idea on God's earth what that might be, uh, but, you know, if you're in a, uh, you know, a small, uh, you know, adult faith formation in your parish and some question comes up I might be able to help you with, or, you know, you're in a seminar and some Vatican question arises and you think I might be able to give you some insight, or, I mean, for God's sakes, ladies and gentlemen, if you're coming to Rome and you want restaurant recommendations, <laughs> okay, I mean, this is where I truly shine. Okay. I mean, listen, let me acknowledge to you that one of the real burdens of my office is that so much of my work is done over lengthy Roman lunches and dinners, but I want you to know I am over there carrying the cross for all of you. Okay. So whatever it would be, if I can be of help to you, uh, I have a column uh, in the Boston Globe that is called All Things Catholic. If you just Google John Allen, All Things Catholic, you'll find it. Uh, at the bottom of that column is my email address. Very simple, it's john.allen at globe.com, but you can find it online. Uh, you know, be, feel free to be in touch. Now, if you're gonna do that, please put in the subject line like Malloy College or something, so I don't think you're the fourth Nigerian prince today who's gonna give me 30 million bucks if I just, you know, give you my bank account information. But, it, but, if, you, but if you permeate my spam filter, <laughs> uh, and if there's any way I can be of assistance to you, I'd be delighted to do that. Thank you. Good night. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. What? What's that? I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Allen again for that.
fascinating talk. Uh, Let the people speak. Oh, look at that. They love it. If I could just uh, have your attention. <laughs> Uh, if I could just have your attention for one more minute. You know, an event like this involves a lot of people, and I want to thank a few people right now. I'd like to thank Sister Dorothy and the Office of uh, Mission. I'd like to thank... Uh, I'd like to thank Ed Thompson and the Office of Advancement for funding this event, and the Departments of Philosophy and Theology uh, for organizing it. But... Uh, thank you. But you know, I am a philosopher, and I couldn't do this event on my own, because we philosophers can't do anything practical. And there are two people here who are responsible for putting this together, and they really deserve a round of applause. I'd like to thank Marilyn Mara from the Office of Advancement. And I'd especially like to thank Miss Grace Cramsey. Where are you, Grace? Please stand up, who did a lot of the work. Grace? So thank you. You know, this event is not quite over yet. Um, we do have, uh, the tradition of the St. Thomas Lecture goes back to Europe, Catholic European universities, and it always ends with the social to celebrate the old feast day of St. Thomas. We're not celebrating the, the current feast day, this is the old feast day. Um, for those of you who are uh, fasting for Ash Wednesday, we have coffee and tea on the first level upstairs. For those of you who are not observing, on the second level is the traditional social. Um, you're free to choose. God gave you free will. So uh, thank you all for coming. And please, you could speak to Mr. Allen further upstairs if you'd like. Oh, uh, one more thing. Would all the Sisters of St. Dominic who are in the audience, would you please come up to uh, the stage? Thank you. Dominican sisters are noted for their humility, but please overcome it and come to the front of the stage. You don't have to come